Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Lawrence Brown. I am one of the sector specialists working with the Department for International Trade's Agri-Tech team. Uh, I'm a, uh, a vet by training. Um, I worked in clinical practice in the UK. I actually spent some time out in Australia, in New South Wales, worked in the Hunter Valley, Broken Hill, a bit of time in Newcastle and, and, and Sydney. Um, and then on coming back to the UK, spent some time uh, in the pharmaceutical industry uh, before setting up as a consultant about four years ago, uh, helping to support uh, animal health and agri-tech businesses uh, in the private sector. And about two years ago, started working with the Department for International Trade, helping to support inward investment to the UK uh, within the, the DIT Agri-Tech team. Uh, I, I focus on animal health and um, aquaculture businesses. Yeah, thanks, Lawrence. So, uh, hello, everybody. I'm Chris Horn, a uh, colleague of Lawrence's in the DIT from the UK. And like Lawrence, my background is on the crop side of the industry rather than the animal side. Um, I'm a plant scientist and agronomist by uh, education. Um, spent over 20 years in the crop protection industry in various parts of the world in uh, marketing and uh, product development roles. Um, been on the consulting side for about the last 15 years and been part of the DIT's Agritech team over the past uh, year and a half, where I specialize in plant science and precision agriculture. And I guess I'll go to my to me. I see uh, Michael's come back yeah, on, but I'm back um, on. just to finish off. <laughs> so hi, everyone. My name is Johnny Henwood. Um, so unlike Chris and Lawrence, they're based in the UK. I'm based in Sydney. Uh, so firstly, to introduce the Department for International Trade. So the UK Department for International Trade, or DIT, I'll shorten it to today, just to save that mouthful. Uh, we are the trade investment agency of the UK government. So we are similar or equivalent to Austrade in many ways. Um, we have three focuses with DIT. So firstly, uh, trade, so imports, then to investment, which uh, the three of us, Chris Lawrence, myself, are focused on getting um, Australian businesses and other foreign businesses um, to uh, physically set up a presence in the UK and then also the policy side as well which is yeah in full swing at the moment with uh, Brexit now over or officially happened. Um, so how do I fit into the picture? So I'm based in Sydney but we also have uh, we have eight people in the Australian New Zealand team for investment so the ANZ market works together so we've got Annette in Auckland, myself and two others in Sydney. We've got uh, Mark in Brisbane, and then we've got two people in Melbourne as well, and Kirsty in Perth. So we are all geographically based and we're all sector agnostic, but myself, I'm taking an interest in agri-tech. I'm actually from Gundawindi myself, growing up on a mixed uh, property um, all my life. And I've just recently come back and locked myself out of Queensland for the time being. <laughs> So with DIT, uh, we provide free and confidential services for um, Australian investors looking at the UK market. We provide a, a whole range of services, uh, market research, depending on how mature or how um, interested the, uh, the Australian investor may be. Um, we can conduct, conduct market research for all of the UK or if it's more specialised, we work with local enterprise partners, so LEPs. Um, and can connect you to a more localised team, whether it be Manchester, Leeds, London, um, or also the devolved administration, so Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and then England, England itself. Um, but that's me, and that's us in a nutshell. And I basically meet investors in Sydney and uh, my colleagues around in the different offices as well. And we collate all the information and what you're trying to achieve in um, the UK market and then I connect you to more uh, bespoke and specialised support back in the UK so I set up a virtual team and then Lawrence and Chris feed into that as well um, so they're from industry as they said and um, yeah they're now contracted to headquarters at HQ in DIT to provide yeah the more sophisticated analysis of the UK agri ecosystem um, but I'll stop there thanks and I guess we'll pass over to Michael now Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, apologies for the earlier technical difficulties. It's uh, good to be with everybody uh, tonight. Uh, so yeah, um, my job here is basically to facilitate the conversation uh, this evening or this morning, wherever you are. 
Um, so to start with, um, what we're going to do is basically throw over to, uh, to Chris. Um, what we're going to basically start with is a bit of an overview of uh, agriculture within the UK. Um, so this is particularly relevant for the ag tech companies that are on the line um, this evening, just to get a bit of an understanding of, of what the actual industry opportunity is over there. And then um, as we progress through the conversation, we're going to look a little bit deeper into the actual ag tech innovation ecosystem over in the UK as well. So, uh, Chris, so if you'd like to um, go uh, through your presentation, that'd be great. Sure thing. Yeah, we've just got a very few slides here to give the audience uh, a kind of whistle stop tour of um, UK uh, agriculture just to set the scene. So um, just to start off comparing the, the two countries, I think you don't need to be a genius to know that Australia is much bigger than the UK. Uh, but after today's presentation, you can amaze your friends with your knowledge that um, the, the differential is actually 32 times. So uh, UK is just about 3% the land area of, of Australia. However, we do have a population that is about two and a half times the size of the Australian population. Um, so we're quite a densely populated, if uh, rather small island. Um, and if we can go to the next slide, uh, Pip, we'll just look at the uh, agricultural um, scene in, in, in the UK. So about 75% of the UK's land area is devoted to um, <clears throat> agriculture, divided as you can see on, on, on the slide. Um, the really in, intensive part of agriculture is the, you know, the 6.1 million hectares down to uh, crops. Um, so that compares to about 31 million hectares in, in Australia. So we're about <clears throat> a fifth of the intensely cropped area of Australia. Um, that is split between quite a large arable proportion and just over 1 million hectares of temporary uh, grass. And on the arable front, we're quite cereals dominated. About two thirds of the area is down to cereals. And then you have various break crops, the most important of which being all seed rape. Um, apart from that, you've got things like specialist root crops, potatoes and sugar beet, and also, of course, a, a specialist uh, horticulture sector. So if we can move to the next uh, slide again, um, where I'm just going to be looking at the uh, size of the industry. So although we've got um, fewer hectares than Australia, um, we tend to be very intensive in, in production. Uh, so actually the total size of the um, output of our two industries is actually quite similar. It's about 50 billion US dollars in the UK and about 60 billion in Australia. Um, our, our most valuable outputs uh, off the farm are, as you can see from this slide, are milk followed by poultry and then wheat. And uh, in Australia, as you probably know, that this slide would read cattle and then wheat and then milk. So it's a little bit, a uh, little bit different, but we do share uh, big interests in, in in wheat and milk and many other uh, commodities. Um, if we look at the size of the markets that you'd be sort of pitching into if you came to the UK, um, our markets for the sort of inputs that farmers are typically using are amongst the largest in, in England. And you can see some pretty large numbers on the slide there that gives you some detail on, on that. If we move forward again, Pip, um, I'm going to show you a picture of uh, the average UK farm. Um, I'm not sure if there actually is a farm that looks precisely like this in the UK, but according to the statistics, this is the, the average. Um, I don't expect you to read all the data on the slide. Obviously, you can study that at your leisure um, later. But the key points are that we've got about um, 217,000 farm holdings. That contrasts with about 89,000 in Australia. Um, but we must say a huge number of those holdings are very small or even part time. There's something more like 50 or 60,000 uh, what you would call professional farmers, which is more comparable to Australia. Um, the average farm size is just 81 hectares, uh, which compares to over 3,000 in Australia. Um, but as I've said, the, the industry is really concentrated towards the bigger farmers and quite intensive production. Um, as this picture shows, there are some actually quite big differences in, in geography and where different types of agriculture is located, um, despite the fact that we're quite a small country. Um, our weather tends to come from the southwest. So the west 
uh, side of the country tends to be wetter than the east. Um, the western side of the country, especially towards the north, is more hilly or mountainous. Uh, and the south uh, of the country and the eastern side, really all the way up, tends to be flatter and a bit drier and sunnier than the west. So this leads to a concentration of agriculture. Livestock is more concentrated towards the west and the northern regions of the country. Um, the arable areas are more in the southeast and up the east coast. And then in the purple colours, you might be able to see there, there are pockets of horticulture, um, about half a dozen hotspots for those in, in different parts of the country. So <clears throat> depending on what sort of company you are, you might decide to locate, if you're a livestock company, for example, in an intensive dairy area, if you're in the arable field, you might want to be in the arable areas. Um, but having said that, um, you know, the country is relatively small. So wherever you are, the distances are not great. Um, so I did a bit of a research last night and I found that if you look at the distance of the UK from north to south, it's pretty similar to the distance between Adelaide and Melbourne, just to put that into context. So wherever you are, you're actually not far from the rest of it. Okay, next slide, please, Pip. Um, just wanted to finish by giving you just a little feel for um, what the marketplace is like if you go to the UK. So, um, firstly, the sort of more arable or crop side of things. Despite quite a high number of farmers, as I've said, there's a, quite a big concentration towards the, the, the larger farms. And in fact, there's really only about five or 6,000 um, businesses which control around 80% of the crop area with our usual 80-20 rule coming into play. Um, likewise, the distribution of companies supplying inputs and other things to those farmers is quite concentrated. There's really a big four or five companies which again control around 75 or 80 percent of the market um, who, 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 who was really the route to market for many people. And, and last but not least, I've highlighted the key role of agronomists. So about 75 percent of our growers would use an agronomist. About half of those are private um, in individuals or private individuals working for a larger farming company and the other half are agronomists um, employed or linked to those distributors. So quite, quite a concentrated market but a very professional and intensive one. Uh, I think if we move to the next slide, um, Lawrence will say a few words on the livestock side of things and then it's back to you Michael I think. Thanks Chris. So yeah just very briefly around the UK livestock market structure um, I, I'd say it's probably a bit more varied than uh, on the crop side. So the way the uh, livestock grazing farmers in the, in the north and in the west, they'll uh, operate very differently to some of the more intensive farming uh, systems in, in, in uh, poultry and pigs, for example. Um, in terms of route to market within agri-tech, it's very uncommon in the UK to go direct to the farmer. Um, there are other countries in Europe, Ireland, for example, where that's more commonplace. But in the UK, it tends to be through uh, via trusted partners. So in terms of route to market for Australian agri-tech in the UK, I'd say collaboration and partnerships are, are key, very important. Um, the animal feed sector is a massive sector here in the UK, worth about five and a half billion pounds every year. So nutritionists are, are, are valued partners in the livestock farming uh, sector, as are the vets as well. Um, so in terms of annual veterinary expenses, you're looking at about half a billion pounds a year. I'd say probably about 350, 400 million pounds of that is actually veterinary medicines, parasiticides, uh, uh, diagnostics, uh, vaccines, and the rest will be on, on veterinary services. So again, through vet channels is, is definitely uh, one route to market, depending on the subsector within livestock farming that you're operating in and, and the types of products and services that you offer. But there's a number of, um, a number of trusted partners uh, throughout the sort of livestock uh, value chain, whether it's industry partners, technology partners, through the retail sales channels with, with merchants and distributors, and also through advisors and consultants, whether these are agribusinesses or through uh, universities uh, and other research institutes. So, um, yeah, I think depending on, on the type of business you are and the, and the subsector within livestock farming that you operate, there will be a, an ideal route to market there available for you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Lawrence and uh, and Chris. That's an excellent overview, and uh, I think 
very interesting to get an understanding of that that go to market and that route to market through distributors and, and agronomists and so forth. I think that is uh, is something that we're starting to see become more and more established in the Australian market as well. Um, so uh, really interesting to see that uh, that similarity. Um, I suppose to to dig a little bit deeper. What are some of the, the key opportunities um, for technology within the industry and, and where are you seeing sort of, I guess, perhaps adoption challenges or technology challenges that are um, seeking solutions that um, ag tech companies uh, could look to solve? Uh, I might start with uh, Chris on the, um, on the cropping side. Yes, yeah, good, good question, Michael. So as I said, it's very intensive. Um, our, our yields are relatively high. I think our wheat yields um, are the highest on average unirrigated yields in the world so, so you might think everything's perfect and we don't need anything new in the uk um, but that's far from the case there are many challenges that these arable farmers are are facing so for example the yields of many of our leading crops like wheat are, are rather plateauing these days farmers are struggling to push their yields uh, onwards um, and there's definitely a yield gap between what they're achieving and what the potential is so we need help in closing that uh, I think also farmers would say that there are relatively few rotational options that they've got around the cereals. So something in novel crops would be in, in, in interesting. Um, there's also some effort needed, I think, to join the farmers up more closely along the food chain. Um, they're working as primary producers, um, but the links as you go upwards then with that produce in the food chain are not always obvious and therefore it's not always easy to really grow to the specification of an end market. We've got problems uh, growing with um, weed pest and disease resistant, which I know you have in Australia as well. And al alongside that, we've lost a lot of the older crop protection chemistry as it's fallen by the wayside of the you know, stronger and stronger regulations that we've had. And a lot of products are more restricted in use. So, so the farmer is battling a more challenging target, but with a smaller armory of of products um, so at the same time he's trying to become more and more efficient in production which i think gives you a, a need for agritech and also along with that there's a big demand on the farmer to become more and more sustainable um, which again can be helped by agritech maybe that's something we can develop a, a bit later so i think there's a lot of challenges there that our farmers um, need help with and which you know agritech companies can potentially can contribute to yeah and i'm really interested to to as we continue the discussion today um pick up on some of those regulatory and sustainability challenges um as as there's more constraint mm -hmm. on, on the inputs that can be applied um and and whether or not you see that um you know starting to present more and more opportunities for alternative inputs um in, in different farming systems um you know both on the cropping and the livestock mm -hmm. um side so um i might throw the same question mm -hmm. over to to lawrence um to to give us a bit of input on the livestock side. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, there's a number of areas that UK livestock farmers can do with uh, support and, and help with. Um, data capture, there's still a lot of uh, really useful information that's not being captured on farm uh, and feeding into sort of supply chain transparency and, and traceability. Um, we'll probably touch on COVID at, at some point um, throughout the, uh, the, the discussion. But that was a real issue for, for the farming sector in terms of being able to navigate the volatility and demand with uh, lockdown and closure of restaurants and cafes and helping farmers to better predict what, you know, what their agricultural outputs. So, um, and the other thing I wanted to mention is Department for, Internet for Environmental and Rural Affairs, DEFRA, in the UK, um, they are launching a new livestock a livestock information program at the end of this year. It's a major industry government partnership to uh, enhance digital traceability within the livestock supply chain. So we're going to need a, a huge amount of, of world-class technology from all over the world to achieve that really ambitious plan. So that's a, a massive opportunity. Um, food safety and welfare. So it's in the press quite a lot at the moment, threats of uh, chlorinated chicken and on hormone treated beef. What I can say, the UK has been an absolute leading figure when it comes to uh, optimizing uh, animal welfare standards in, in the EU and, and even globally. Um, our farmers uh, are very proud of, of their farming practices and, and totally understand that welfare and productivity go hand in hand. It, it's by no means a trade-off. And um, 
the UK food and drink sector has uh, has a very strong brand, very strong reputation, and that starts with mm -hmm. with how uh, animals are produced on farm. So I think the issue around food safety and welfare is, is products and services that help communicate the good work that farmers are doing and, and promoting food safety and welfare in the UK. So there's certainly an opportunity there. Agri businesses, as with every business, and um, during COVID time, there has been additional costs, you know, whether it's um, PPE, managing social distancing, optimizing biosecurity, disinfection. And, and that's not necessarily translated in, in the, the price that farms are getting for their cost of goods at the other end. So what that has done is, I think, really um, driven the need for products and services that drive productivity and efficiency on farm to help maximize um, those livestock farmers' uh, profit margins. That's really important. Um, and to pick up on sustainability, absolutely, you know, livestock's the same uh, as it is for crops and, and plants. Uh, sustainability is, is key at the moment. There was actually a, an independent report that came out last week from one of our UK agri-tech centres, the Centre for Innovation Excellence in Livestock, which showed that if all carbon mitigation methods were implemented today, uh, we'd only achieve uh, about a fifth of our carbon reduction targets by 2035 in the UK. So that really demonstrates the need for te sustainable technologies. So reducing carbon footprint, mm -hmm. managing waste, looking after water supplies, et cetera. So that's, that's really important. Uh, and the last, the last uh, area that I'll highlight is, I'm biased because I'm a vet, so this is something that I'm quite passionate about, is, is animal health. Um, and to copy, there's a, a major animal health company called Zoetis. They're the, the largest animal health company in the world, spin out from Pfizer. And they talk about this um, continuum of care. So for a huge number of years within livestock farming, it was all about therapeutics. You know, when a cow got sick, how do we treat that sick cow? But then there was an awareness around things like antimicrobial resistance and how we had to safeguard these antibiotics, not just for animals, but also for humans. So that then moved us more towards technologies around diagnosing diseases, preventing diseases, and predicting diseases. But I like to add another area to the continuum of care, which is performance. And that's very much where Agritech comes in. Um, it's something like 20% of, of animal proteins don't make the, the, the market because of ill health and because of disease and, and, and death on farm. So actually, how can we get more from less and, and to make sure that what we're inputting into the livestock mm -hmm. sector isn't wasted? Um, so uh, yeah, there's a, there's a huge number of opportunities within the, uh, within the UK agri-tech at the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thanks, Lawrence. Some really interesting um, examples there that um, I'm sure that we'll continue to um, pull on some of those threads as we uh, continue the, the conversation. Uh, there's some really good questions coming through, so I'll make sure that um, as we uh, progress, uh, we'll make sure we've got enough time to, to throw a few of those questions out and um, and, and give the responses to the audience. Um, I might bring uh, Johnny back into the conversation here and, uh, you know, coming from a farming background in Australia and having exposure to the UK um, industry as well. Um, what uh, types of similarities uh, are you seeing between Australia and uh, the UK? Um, industry that uh, ag tech companies could uh, learn from. Thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, so starting this role now a year ago now, it's been interesting um, to learn about both markets. Um, I think the interesting thing to me is that, you know, Chris was talking about it before, the UK obviously has a lot of rain, it's a very wet climate, and Australia, um, very dry, depending on where you are, majority of the country. Um, so I, I headed down to Evoke Ag at the start of the year, and that's where I met Lawrence and Chris, which was great. Um, and I came across um, going to Ag actually, and we used their tech on our property um, out at Gundy, Gundawindi, and um, it was interesting um, talking to to the you know the management at Evoke from Goanna. And um, although their tech um, is it, or that to if the audience that doesn't, doesn't know Goanna, the tech started out primarily as moisture technology, um, so efficiency monitoring for, for irrigation. Um, so yeah, for cotton and whatnot. And so, you know, I thought there's probably not a use for this technology 
um, in the UK, but I talked to them more and they said, actually, it's an opportunity because the UK has more, has too much water. So they see application for it in, in the UK market. Um, and yeah, while in Australia, it's all about, you know, how do we maximize irrigation water because it's such a scarcity, scarce resource. Um, but beyond that as well, we have, you know, different clients that have come across, have, have come across in the past. Um, Agri-tech is such a, a diverse and broad term, um, but narrowing that down a bit more. So Safe Ag Systems, so um, Katie Lant from um, Safe Ag Systems, she was part of our London Tech Week delegation, a speaker on one of the panels um, a few weeks ago, and um, they're involved in um, safety management on farm with apps, and also AgriWeb as well. So talking about um justin webb's journey so he came in contact with dit um back in 2016 uh, he was in london for a an event um and he basically flew just a market scoping trip and from there yeah the cog started turning um and it, he got in contact with my director tess who was in my position at the time um and yeah fast forward today he's got seven staff in the uk he's doing really well but to you know, give a brief background on how we assisted him, we helped him navigate where to set up in the UK uh, because you know different regions offer different um, uh, grants, benefits, and whatnot. Um, and also understanding the the talent pool. So our team in the UK, so the investment services team, are able to conduct market research, which I was talking about earlier at the start of the the um, session. Um, so they were able to pro provide him that information. Um, and also um, tax uh, visas, legal um, questions. We've got a dedicated department in London for that. So the business and environment advisory team will beat. Um, so Paul Webster, who's our banking um, sort of guru, um, has chats all the time with, with Australian investors navigating the, yeah, the, it, quite an intimidating kind of uh, aspect of when to look international. and. He knows the ins and outs of that. And um, yeah, he's been great. Uh, and yeah, he's picks up whenever with um, with any client if they're needing it, more help. Um, and it's, mm -hmm. I should highlight that it's not just the initial market entry, which we help clients with. Um, we also help with expansion projects as well. So Justin um, started prim uh, initially in Northern Ireland and then um, he wanted to grow his team. Uh, back in England, um, and we were able to help him um, source an office in London um, and point him in the right direction with London and Partners, who are the local enterprise partner in the in London itself. So, yeah, uh, lots of different stakeholder um, engagement and different introductions to people was basically how I fit in with um, helping clients get into the UK. Awesome. No, thanks for that, Johnny. There's um, a couple of great examples. Uh, I know uh, the founders of, of both those companies, especially uh, Safe Ag Systems. So great to see uh, Katie uh, getting involved in that. Um, maybe to sort of continue on that theme, um, Lawrence. You know, within the UK, what does the um, ag tech ecosystem look like in terms of you know some of the companies, um, incubators, the you know the the universities that are contributing to innovation in this space? Um, how mature is that? I, I know that in uh, Australia, um, you know, Evoke Ag is sort of like the the barometer of the ecosystem's maturity over over each year. Um, and it's been great to see it evolve here. Um, what is what is that same sort of journey um, and evolution in the ag tech ecosystem in the UK looking like? Yeah, it's a really good question. I'll, I'll try and unpack that. There's, there's a huge amount going on in the UK at the moment when it comes to agri tech, um, which it has its ups and downs. It's a bit of a blessing and a curse at the same time. Um, but I'd say there's a number of very, very strong clusters throughout the UK. So if we look at it regionally, if you're looking in the sort of the southwest of England and in the Midlands, these are really dairy sector heartlands. And they're also for like precision engineering companies as well, really strong parts of the, of the UK for agri-tech. You've also got world leading uh, agricultural universities like um, RAU and Harper Adams, a very fierce rivalry between those two. Um, and then agri-tech uh, incubators like Farm 491 as well are based in that, that location. So that's that's a really exciting part of the UK at the moment. 
more on the, the crop side, and, and Chris can speak to this uh, much better than I can. Certainly in the south and in and in the east, in particular, of England is the real really England's breadbasket. You know, in, around Cambridgeshire, for example, and you've got some very strong uh, you know, research institutes like Rotherham said, uh, and then also you know obviously like Cambridge University as well, massive for uh, university spin-outs, life sciences, technologies, etc. As you start to go a bit further north in the UK, then you start getting towards the, the sort of northern powerhouse where we have um, a really unique partnership called the NA AgriFood, which is a partnership between eight universities to, to promote and bolster the, uh, the agri-food sector here in the UK. And on the livestock side, they, you know, it's an ideal location for companies that are operating in, in livestock nutrition or, or livestock husbandry. Um, and in Scotland, where, where I'm based, so I'm based in, um, in Edinburgh, and we have one of the largest clusters of, of uh, animal science researchers in, in the whole of Europe, based here uh, in the south of the city. Um, so yeah, and that's, you know, we're seeing a huge amount of entrepreneurship in the region and innovation and some really, really disruptive technologies that are coming out. You've then got a few organizations that help try to bridge and connect all these various clusters throughout the UK. As, as Chris has mentioned, geographically, the UK is not a, a huge um, uh, landmass. So it's, it's pretty accessible to, to all these various regions. Um, I should really mention at this stage, we have something in the UK or called the UK Agritech Centers. So these are four centers of agricultural excellence. They were launched in 2013. Uh, and the four centers, but they all have one vision. So they sort of communicate to one goal. They cover um, uh, crops, they cover livestock, they cover agricultural data, and they cover precision engineering. And all these centers, they, they operate slightly differently, but in, in general, they tend to be a membership consortium of, of farm all the way to, to fork, uh, various different companies along the supply chain. And they, they're great for and navigating the UK's innovation funding landscape. So they look to coordinate big projects, help SMEs partner up with large retailers or large uh, agri-tech industries or large agri-businesses, I should say. Um, they have a number of assets throughout the UK where you can trial new technologies. Um, just to mention one, for example, we have the Southwest Dairy Development Centre, which is a, a state-of-the-art dairy farm uh, down in the Southwest, which has robotic milkers, it has precision grazing technologies, automated feed troughs, it's, it's incredible. Um, and that has been a great opportunity for startups to get their technology onto farm and to, for farmers to, to see the benefits of, of that technology. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to say very quickly on this, it's an incredible time for agriculture at the moment in the UK as it is across the world. Um, you know, there's, the economy is going to go through a bit of a challenge, you know, over the next few years with everything that's happening with, with COVID. So those companies that have those, those technologies, those proof of concepts that make a big difference on farm, they're growing rapidly now um, and seeking investments to take their, take their technologies to the next level. So we were very much in the sort of emerging area of agri-tech and um, it does feel like we've sort of moved on to, to the next chapter within the UK agri-tech journey. Um, new trade agreements going forward as well. So it'd be interesting to see you know, the outcomes of those negotiations and discussions. And the last thing I just wanted to mention on that as well is UK is a great um, launch pad to other markets as well. So we have one example I can give you is uh, New Zealand um, uh, agribusiness uh, company called Abacus Bio, uh, who landed here in the UK a number of years back. And actually, since along their journey, they've been developing here locally within the UK. But they are now doing a, a huge amount in Africa as well, looking to service and support smallholder farmers across across the continent. Um, so yeah, it's a really exciting time. There's a lot going on at the moment. Um, so I, it is important to have, you know, local partners and to have, uh, you know, tapped into our network here at DIT, and we can help support businesses to navigate everything that's going on here. 
That's great. There's um, so much coordination happening, which is uh, sometimes the uh, the most difficult part of, of getting things moving in, in this space. So that's excellent to see. And, um, you know, also good to hear that there's some of those demonstration farms. Um, I know that there's a number of those getting up and running in Australia. Um, and and I, I, I'm definitely a huge supporter of those. I think they're going to be a huge enabler of, uh, in, you know, really demonstrating capability and, and getting um, agricultural um, producers um, involved in, in this technology. Um, one of the other things which uh, I might bring uh, Chris back into the conversation on is, is really around that that investment side. I mean, um, having uh, in my past life been an entrepreneur and, and built companies, I know that um, getting investment is incredibly important to, to develop in this mm -hmm. tech. Um, Chris, what does the um, investment landscape look like in the UK and uh, from both, a, I suppose, a uh, a venture capital, angel networks, um, and, and perhaps maybe some of the, the larger family offices um, being involved as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great, great question. Again, I'm, I'm sure most people in the audience know that um, uh, London is one of the big sort of three or four financial centres uh, around the world. Um, and it, it's certainly a major um, in, in investment centre. Uh, I was looking up the other day at the British Venture Capital Association uh, and I found they have over 700 member firms, which shows you kind of the size of the investment community uh, in London. And they raised for companies over 50 billion pounds in 2019, which was 11 percent of the entire venture capital raised in the world. So there's plenty of um, capital um, being invested um, within the UK. Um, aside from venture capital firms, as you said, we also have are the location for a number of family funds, um, high net worth individuals, mm -hmm. angel investors and others. So, so in general, I think it's a great place to raise money. Um, of course, most of that community hasn't been that interested in agriculture or agri-tech in, in the past. Um, but what, what we're seeing is um, more of those investors getting interested in this space. It's, it's fairly rapidly becoming, I would say, a, a fairly trendy sector in the investment community, whereas it wasn't probably even two or three years ago. So agri-tech would still be, I would say, a quite a small percentage, probably less than 2% of the capital being invested in, in London and the UK. But it is growing and there are more people getting involved. Um, I've, I've got a quote here, actually, um, from um, the Ag Fund uh, European report for 2020 on agri-food investment uh, or agri-food tech investment. Uh, 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 and they make the point that the UK actually topped the European league table for 2019, um, tallying more than the next two or three countries uh, combined. Uh, and they make the point that the investment in agri-tech in the UK is is about one third of the total going in, 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 in Europe. So. So I think we can rightly claim to be the European champions for investment <laughs> in um, ag agri-tech. Um, and it's certainly a good good place to come if you're looking to raise capital today. Um, for sure. Yeah, and I think um, one thing we've seen in, in Australia is, um, you know, a couple of dedicated funds, um, you know, with things like Tenacious Ventures getting up and running and also a lot mm -hmm. of uh, mm -hmm. funds from um, Artesian as well um, focus mm -hmm. on this. and. And one thing I, I really saw um, probably about 18 months ago was there was a, a shift in thinking around ag tech business models, um, which made these companies more attractive to venture capital um, investors, um, much more scalable. So uh, I think that that uh, is often a bit of a catalyst for more of that investment um, focus to be in, on ag tech. So I um, definitely look to, to see that improve and, and uh, you know, get more, more capital into the sector, which is uh, important to develop these technologies. Some of them are quite expensive to uh, to get uh, commercialized. So that's incredibly mm -hmm. important part of it. Um, keeping an eye on time, um, what I might do is just sort of, uh, I wanna make sure, cause we've got some really good questions um, there. Mm -hmm. Just to sort of um, uh, throw it over to Johnny to, to talk about, I suppose, companies that are looking to, uh, you know, get into the UK market and start to, to collaborate with, with DIT, with Austrade and everything. Um, what, what does that process look like? And, and sort of how do they take that first step and engage with you guys? Yep. So the usual step or progression in conversation, it goes, so you'll see at the end of this um, session, they'll, my, web, my email address um, and my LinkedIn as well. So either or both for people to get in contact with me. 
and then depending on where um, the Australian business is based. So if it's if they're based in ACT or New South Wales, that's perfect. I'm the go-to person for that. Um, but I'll direct them to the respective investment officer in whatever state. But what happens? Yeah, I have a meeting, have a have a chat, intro call with the client, um, see what their plans are um, in terms of the UK um, market entry, and then I get them specialised um, support. Um, all this is free and confidential. Again, um, I should highlight. Um, so in the investment services team, um, they're part of DIT um, and they're contracted to provide research, as I said before, um, and they are UK based support. So I'm, I'm the Australian point of contact, but I then connect them to UK based IST or investment services team support. And then from there on, um, depending on what they're wanting to know about the UK, if they if, some investors are already British but live in Australia, so they may know more about the UK market and they might want, um, you know, just some specific help, say bank accounts, visas. But then if they're an Australian investor and they've only been to the UK a couple of times or haven't at all, then, um, yeah, get them in contact with Lawrence and Chris and we, depending, you know, if they're in animal health with Lawrence or plant precision with Chris um, and they can have a more of a specialised chat but we're there the whole time. There's no timeline we work with any client because every client is dynamic. Every business is dynamic. Dynamic. Um, so, yeah, we work with clients up to, yeah, three or four years, depending on, you know, where they're at or mm -hmm. might come first in contact with a the client and then six months later in the UK. Just it's all, yeah, very different. It's all on ad hoc basis, but we're always here in market to help those, any, yeah, any clients. Um, does that answer your question? Awesome, thanks, Johnny. And uh, and Lawrence, is there anything specific that you want to add to, to that around um, uh, you know what what the UK can offer to Australian companies? Yeah, I think just to add to what Johnny's covered it really well. But just to add, you know, there's not sort of one size fits all. There's not a standard blueprint. We we really do work with solo entrepreneurs all the way up to large multinational enterprises and and everything else in between. Um, as I mentioned, there's a huge amount going on here in the UK and there might be um, you know, certain geographical locations that would be better suited for your business. And as Johnny mentioned, we're, we're, it, our, our support and services are totally free. You know, there's no catch. We just want to see innovative, um, you know, good agri-tech businesses to come to the United Kingdom and we want to see you expand and, and, and grow here. Uh, and just on that, you know, there's not... Um, there's not a, it's not like a box ticking exercise. You know, once you're here, it's not like our door closes. You know, it very much remains open. And actually, we go through that journey with a number of businesses, and it's about helping you to expand uh, and to develop and grow. Um, just more specifics around agri tech. UK is really, really uh, positive for innovation funding. There's a huge amount of innovation funding that's available through things like the Industrial Challenge Strategy Fund, which is about 4.6 billion pounds of, of, of business research funding that's going, that's not just agri-tech, that's across you know, all, all sectors. We also have, coming towards the end, but we are also had agri-tech catalyst funding, um, which helped to accelerate the speed at which uh, agri-tech uh, research was commercialized. And a lot of that funding now is helping UK businesses to, uh, to uh, provide products and services for smallholder farmers in Africa and to um, to India as well. So actually helping businesses here take advantage of some of the local opportunities as well as some of those international opportunities as well. Yep. And if I could just add to yep. Lawrence there with um, sort of the innovation side, coming into this role at um, the IT, Department for International Trade, what I've noticed what the UK does exceptionally well in is bringing stakeholders together. So Innovate UK um, is the UK's R&D, Research and Development Agency. There's no real equivalent here in Australia to it. Um, you always want to think CSIRO, but that's definitely more scientific based. So you Innovate UK um, are purely designed to um, around grants, R&D incentives for businesses to keep growing in the UK and then from there on to you know, hopefully start exporting their sales and services um, outside of the UK market. Um, and that's, as Lawrence said, a very 
a great benefit of DIT is, you know, once you're set up and then you are at that mature stage, we then flip the lens on you and then you're looked as an, as an exporter and we can connect you to all the different DIT offices around the world, depending on where you're looking at. Um, and also the knowledge transfer network as well is a great um, stakeholder engagement organ organization. And yeah, they bring all the different um, agri tech, agri um, stakeholders together. And there's weekly emails sent out with funding and grants um, and events that are on as well. And if I could just quickly add to that as well, I just want to highlight the, the UK agri tech centers again. I, I mentioned, you know, they do a huge amount of helping businesses to navigate the innovation funding landscape. They have these demonstration farms and I think it's about 70, 70 million pounds of investments and in demonstration farms throughout the UK. But what they're really undervalued for is their internal business development. So you as, a, as a, an SME uh, or a startup, you know, resources might be might be limited and lean. But you could be sat in a room next to a major decision maker from a large multinational company. And um, I think they're really undervalued for that sort of internal business development amongst members. And I've seen that work really, really well time and time again, not just for UK agri-tech startups, but say you are an Australian business that's coming to the UK, you know, to have that instant network, that instant support, that instant structure for your business to grow here. I, 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 don't, I haven't seen that done anywhere else in the world. So I think the agri-tech centers are a great yeah. asset here for, for the UK agri-tech. Awesome. Thanks, guys, for that uh, overview. I just want to throw you um, over to Chris. Is there any, anything uh, um, before we go to questions at all that you wanted to contribute to that, um, that discussion? Yeah, just very, very quickly. Um, you know, we've, we've talked quite a bit about um, yeah, that ecosystem in the UK. Um, uh, I, I, I'd like to, to add is that, um, again, Lawrence described there's a huge amount going on here, a huge number of organizations that can help you and uh, work with you. But for first time people coming to the UK, that can look quite fragmented and a bit scary. And um, sometimes the organizations don't have exact equivalents to what you're used to in Australia. So again, tap into the DIT support and we can help you navigate that landscape and join you up with all, all the right people so yeah we're, we're there alongside you to help you yeah get the best from that actually quite deep and, and broad ecosystem excellent and uh for everyone uh on the on the webinar today um a lot of these links are actually in the chat um and uh yeah so some really great resources that have been added there um <clears throat> i might just get to a couple of these questions um so that mm -hmm. Some really good um, stuff that's come through. Um, there was a question, just trying to find it here, um, around the UK Agricultural Bill um, and whether or not there's uh, there's much incorporated into that new UK Agricultural Bill um, to encourage the uptake of uh, agritech. Yeah, shall I take that one, Michael? Um, Go for it. Yeah, so obviously with leaving the EU, the government is now putting through Parliament uh, an agriculture bill which will kind of set out the framework for agriculture post-Brexit. It's our first such bill since the 1960s, um, since we joined the, the EU. Um, and so it's still going through Parliament. So, of course, we don't know the exact final details of what it will look like. But I think the direction of travel is really, really clear. So I think support for farmers will be completely decoupled from um, production or from the farmed um, area, the support will be much more linked to um, sustainability factors that we touched upon um, earlier. So public money provided in return for public goods, we, we say. So this, this encompasses things like taking good care of the soil, um, supporting wildlife and biodiversity and reducing CO2 emissions. Um, farmers will be supported for that. Um, um, but they've also said in there that there might be public money to uh, specifically encourage the uptake of new innovations, new technologies. So we don't know the fine detail on that yet, but, but that direction is, is there a is there a timeline um, on on when that's expected to to pass Parliament? Yeah, by the end of this year. Um, okay. So when we hit the new year and we're, if you like, com completely past the Brexit transition period, then this new bill will be the framework we're working under. Um, so that's com coming soon. Interesting, exciting times ahead. Um, mm -hmm. We're uh, almost out of time. Um, so I know that there's a couple of uh, items that uh, that Pip wants to just cover 
um, before we before we wrap up and, and also thank uh, everyone that's uh, joined us tonight. Um, so from my end, thank you everyone for, uh, for being um, part of this tonight. It's a really, really good conversation. Uh, I'd personally like to thank uh, Johnny, Chris and Lawrence for the discussion tonight. And uh, Pip, I'll, I'll hand back to you to, to wrap things up. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Lawrence, Chris and Johnny. And so we do have some great questions um, in the chat. And so what we're going to do is um, uh, get our UK DIT team to answer those and we'll send them around the answers to participants um, after uh, this along with the webinar recording and also uh, a lot of the links that were mentioned throughout today's um, webinar, they're actually really fantastic resources and I think particularly speaking from an Australian perspective, um, there's a lot of people on the line um, this evening that uh, would really love to see what um, the UK is actually doing um, in a lot of the tech development but also adoption space. So we'll make sure to send the, send these out. And um, mm -hmm. as um, Johnny mentioned, um, you know, we would really love um, anyone who's looking at um, going over to the UK or wants to explore that as a, as a market of opportunity just to connect um, with Johnny and um, he'll be more than happy to uh, triage your uh, needs and um, what your business is aiming to, to achieve uh, into the UK market. Yeah, thanks Pip. I'll just add that, yeah, please feel free to contact me anytime. Um, and if you're not based in New South Wales and ACT, then yeah, no worries. I can always introduce you to my colleagues around the Australian network. Um, but thanks for the session today, Pip and everyone on the panel. Great. Very good. Uh, Pip, was there anything else in terms of um, the uh, AgriWeb case study film um, or anything, any next steps? So otherwise we'll uh, wrap everything up yeah. Um, there. Yeah, sure. We'd, we have been making some great resources with the team at DIT UK, um, including uh, really looking into the AgriWeb uh, journey over into the UK market so people can understand um, using a case study, which a lot of people are already familiar with in how that process actually works. And so we'll, we'll distribute those over the, over the coming weeks and um, make sure that there's any um, our resources that anybody else needs just to reach out. So we'll call it um, there for, the, for this evening, but thank you everyone for um, dialing in. We know that there's a lot of webinars happening at the moment, but really appreciate your time. Thanks all. Thanks everybody. And thanks, thanks again, uh, Chris, Lawrence and Johnny. Really appreciate it. I appreciate you guys getting up early this morning. <laughs> yes, come in. No problem. We'll speak to you all. <laughs> thanks, thanks very much. much. We'll thanks speak to you all soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.